um, so we'll record from now on. And that what that allows us to do is to gather this into the uh, collection of materials that we're gathering about local food, the pandemic, and the future of the food systems, um, which is, you know, becoming something that I think a lot of people are finding very helpful and is a very live topic in lots of ways. Um, so hopefully we're all going to gain from that today. Today we have two speakers. We have uh, Jasmine from CCRI and our friend Nick James, who I believe, Nick, you were actually lined up to do a uh, presentation for us and got cancelled by the pandemic. So this is a yeah. way of restoring that opportunity to you. So we're really pleased to be able to do that. Uh, for those who are new to this format, of we, what we do is we give each speaker 15 minutes to speak um, in turn. And then if you have questions, if you have thoughts, please throw that in the chat as you go along. And that will um, be monitored by Theo, who's going to give you a wave now. Theo's in Brittany at the moment. Not that it matters um, to us, but, this, uh, but I'm sure it matters to him. Um, and he will gather up the chat and then pose those questions afterwards. So we get um, your questions get answered. And just as you see them, as you think of them, pop them into the chat box there. That would be brilliant. Um, OK, I'm going to close this Slido presentation a moment um, so we can uh, get some more later on. So I'm just going to stop that. And I'm going to. Right now, hopefully this is going to work. We are going to hand over to Jazz, who's um, going to start her presentation. Jazz, you all good? Yeah, yeah. I'll start screen sharing now. Okay. So please, yeah, questions as we go into the chat box. Jazz is going to talk for about fifteen minutes. Then we'll go straight over to Nick, um, and then at the end of that, we'll gather up some questions. Great, can you see my screen? Yep. Real. Okay. Great, so um, I'm presenting today about the um, veg box scheme and community supported agriculture in uh, COVID-19 um, report that was um, written by Dr. Amber Wheeler at the Food Foundation. And um, we did it in collaboration, the Food Foundation, a community supported agriculture network for the UK and Better Food Traders. Um, I can see Nat Natasha's here. So Natasha, if you want to add anything at the end, um, please feel free. Um, so um, the Food Foundation is a, a policy and action um, orientated um, organisation um, looking at um, sustainable food systems. And the community supported agriculture network, we support um, uh, CSAs across the UK in um, giving them a voice and mentoring and we work with the Land Workers Alliance on training and things like that um, and the Better Food Traders is um, focused on um, retail enterprises that um, want to promote more sustainable um, uh, food um, supplies and networks. So we collaborated together on this um, and just to explain about me I'm a researcher at CCRI but I also sit on the board for the Community Supported Agriculture Network um, and I took part in, in the survey for this, um, this report. Um, okay so background to the survey, um, in April um, after the Covid lockdown had started um, there were, it became apparent that there was um, a response and a demand for um, local food from veg box schemes. Um, so we came together to do a survey and an interview um, around members um, to, in order to capture that, uh, that data and, and that rise in demand. Um, and also to see what people were doing to prioritise the vulnerable and what support they needed to um, expand capacity. So 101 schemes took part, um, 63 online survey and 38 we contacted directly via phone calls. Um, and we kept the questions pretty short and simple because obviously everyone is in um, a very busy period at this time. It's the beginning of the growing season, um, so growers were very busy. So we just asked um, how many veg boxes were they selling 
before the coronavirus, which we um, decided would be the last week of Feb, and uh, now, which was at that time um, six weeks after that, so mid-April. Um, and then we asked how many people had they on the waiting list or had they got to turn away? Um, and were they taking steps to prioritise vulnerable people and what kind of things they were doing for that? And then if there was anything to support them going forward. So just four simple questions. Um, so this is what our respondents look like. Um, so we've got um, just one large scale um, veg box scheme um, that was supplying around 55,000 boxes a week before COVID. Um, and then we, um, so we split them basically um, on how many veg boxes per week they were selling um, so that we could assess them that way. Um, the next category was between 300 to 2,000 veg boxes a week. So we had 17 of those, um, those veg box schemes. And then we had um, 68 um, schemes that were selling under 300 a week, um, which are mostly organic and local. And then we also separated the community supported agriculture group um, of which we had 15 respondents and they're also under 300 shares a week but because their model works a bit differently we decided to separate them and i'll talk a bit more about that in a minute um, so these are the results um, so this is amalgamated so all of the the schemes together you can see the different colors there um, and how they um, and how um, that changed um, after COVID in total. So you can see there's quite an increase in demand there. Um, so it went from a total of around 70,000 boxes a week um, in February to six weeks later delivering uh, 1,400 uh, 1, um, <laughs> 1, and, and um, actually more than that. So. The sales went up in total by 111 during that 111 percent during that six weeks, um, which is quite significant. Um, and then just to break that down a little bit more, um, we can see that the greatest increase was those veg boxes selling under 3, 000, uh, 300 boxes a week. So they had an increase of 134 um, percent, and those um those 68 uh, small box schemes on average went from 71 boxes per week to 166 boxes a week um, and then you can see also that the the larger box scheme that was selling over 2000 also had a 118 percent increase um which is which is pretty big um and we asked about waiting lists and 82 percent of the schemes had waiting lists and um, had had to close to new orders um, as of April um, and the average waiting list was 160 people and for that larger box scheme it was 6,700 so they're really big um, waiting lists and you can see that the CSA has a smaller increase of 14% but again I'll talk a bit more about why that is and, and the model that that has in a minute. Um, so in terms of prioritising the vulnerable, 65% of the schemes um, were actively trying to do that um, through a variety of ways, moving key workers and vulnerable groups up the waiting list, prioritising them for orders or offering delivery um, to those that are isolating. And uh, we have a quote from, from one of the respondents saying that they were linking up members who are able to deliver to more vulnerable customers, um, which is great work. And then 10% of the schemes also said they created new systems to, to help the economically vulnerable. So things like offering a cheaper veg box to those who were suffering from financial hardship and then offering customers that are better off um, an option to pay a little bit more in order to subsidize those cheaper boxes. And then other people were offering free veg bags and um, veg for local food banks when they were open. So obviously there's a number of constraints that also that um, veg box schemes and CSAs also came up against. Um, so just to talk a bit about those, the main one um, seems to be um, financing and subsidies. So um, within the EU, the UK um, government could have opted for um, subsidies for farms under five hectares, um, but it didn't do that. Um, and as a result, um, 
small scale producers are finding it a lot harder and, and to just um, illustrate that point um, some work done by DEFRA shows that government subsidies on average 10% um, of the income of horticultural holdings that's compared to 79% for cereal producers so there's quite a big difference there in the amount of um, subsidy and sort of baseline income that um, those two different types of um, food producers are getting. And a, a bit more on that, so 63% of our respondents said that investment would help them to increase their supply, um, but loans are unlikely to help because um, they're already financially stre uh, stretched. And because um, a lot of the veg box schemes have taken on an extra risk from planting more, um, they come harvest season, which is about now, um, if the situation had changed, um, people were finding that the, the wherever they got their, their fruit and veg from previously has stabilised and, um, you know, places like um, supermarkets and seeing that supermarket shelves are um, being stocked and are fine, they might then return back to those original sources and therefore the, these um, producers, these veg box schemes would lose out um, through the resources that they've invested to plant more. Um, so they need grants um, that don't need to be paid back in order to help them. And the Land Workers Alliance were asking um, government to supply grants of up to 10,000 to be made available for small scale producers. Um, but uh, in lieu of this, they've set up a solidarity pot um, asking philanthropists to um, contribute to help small scale growers. And um, I think one um, quote that we have illustrates their, their situation really well. And they said, um, why are key workers like us earning a third of the minimum wage? Um, and, and the same um, respondent there thought that this might be due to the, the small farm size and not, reduce, uh, not receiving subsidies and being undercut by imported food prices um, and those being lower. And supermarkets and further compounding that um, situation by creating um, discounts and price competition. And also lack of a pollute pay, pays principle within the global supply chain. So um, not uh, um, accounting for things like long um, transportation times and greenhouse gas emissions from that. And then maybe also um, other effects such as soil degradation um, and heavy chemical use. And then they said, um, until this inequality is addressed, very few farmers will want to move into local food production and increase the supply to meet rapidly rising demand. Um, so even though um, we can produce good fruit, fruit and veg, um, it's difficult for people, especially um, without a farming background or land, to, um, to get into this um, occupation. Although we do know that there is a, um, the want there from people to to do that. So in terms of the future vision and plan, 19% of our respondents mentioned the need for a more coherent and sustainable food on local levels. Um, finally, they also needed uh, financial marketing and administrative support and a vision and plan for that. Um, and a wider conversation around producing food cheaply. Um, they also would, um, well, 9% of them um, expressed a desire for more coordinated efforts um, so um, to link up surplus supply um, and also networks in general would probably help um, coordinate um, producers where one producer might um, grow and um, produce one type of veg and not another and, and helping them to um, to work together to supply um, a, a better range of veg and fruit as well. Um, so again, um, software and admin support, 15% of the schemes mentioned an urgent need um, for that kind of support, especially for online ordering, which is really important in a time of lockdown. Um, they mentioned some useful schemes like the Open Food Network um, and UBI, which I think is a, um, a system from New Zealand, which has the potential for use in the UK. Um, and also mentoring and guidance on how to use these systems um, would have been of great use to them. And, um, uh, one respondent here saying we could take on another 20 to 30 percent of customers if we had better software, which is quite substantial. 
um, another support that they need, um, perhaps more in general as well as in, in COVID-19, is planning permission um, and local authority support for housing, because um, obviously a lot of these areas are um, in uh, remote locations and um, access to them for work is an issue. So being able to give people good quality um, housing on site is, is really important. Um, and also um, training and apprenticeships and marketing uh, more widely about um, the, the benefits of fruit and veg um, and local local produce. Um, and then also some more specific social di distancing guidance um, from government for um, these veg box schemes. Um, so just to elaborate then a little bit on veg box schemes and CSAs and the difference between them, obviously, um, before you saw that there was a 14% increase in the CSAs versus um, much higher increases in um, demand um, and um, supply for veg box schemes. And this is uh, largely, we think, because the, CS, the CSA model is a, um, a real commitment um, from the, um, the customer or the food citizen to um, the producer for a set period of time. So it's a very deep um, understanding between the two um, and uh, a more long-standing commitment and because of this they're often set up to, uh, to feed a specific number of people um, and many commit to um, to grow all or most of the produce they supply so um, within that um, they are potentially more uh, limited than to the number of people that they do supply to um, so they haven't, um, what we found is that they hadn't found uh, many significant impacts due to COVID. Um, they also had a pool of um, volunteers to help where they did um, offer um, assistance to uh, prioritising vulnerable people. They had volunteers to come in and help with deliveries to those people. Um, they also if it had those volunteers there if any members uh, of the produ producing team did fall ill. Um, so they weren't as affected as um, the veg box schemes and they didn't um, take the risk of then um, planting more um, and then potentially having um, less people to buy the produce come harvest time. Um, so even though they, are, they were inflexible in that way, it raises a question about resilience um, and you know, not having the need to do that and um, being fully supported by their members. Um, so in, in another pandemic or another crisis, would, if, we, if every community had a CSA, would we then be resilient with our, our food supply and our healthy food supply? Um, so to conclude, um, veg box schemes appear to be a, a source of resilience in times of crisis that we can see from the demand that there is for them. There's obviously big waiting lists, um, so that um, supply needs to be expanded um, within the existing veg box schemes, but also multiplying those across the country so that people have um, that more local source of uh, fruit and veg. Um, and the government recommends that we eat um, 40%, uh, well, 40% of our diet uh, by weight is made up of fruit and veg. But at the same time as saying this, we import 50% of our veg, well, almost 50%, which is a huge amount. Um, and we know that we can produce a lot more of that. So the ask really is um, to government to support more, um, more uh, fruit and veg producers, and um, especially small scale ones who at the moment aren't receiving any sort of subsidy and some future considerations finally um, it might seem obvious the reasons behind um, people moving towards local food during the crisis but um, we still have a lot to explore um, around that there's many questions um, you know was it the, the scare behind um, supermarket shelves becoming more empty um, uh, and how did people know about these veg box schemes if they hadn't been using them previously? Um, so lots of questions to, to be asked around that. And then um, as we're now two months on, I think, to the week um, that we did that survey, how, have, how has that changed? Um, has that uh, customer um, number dropped off? 
are the veg box schemes now at risk of losing um, resource and finance because people are returning to their original source of fruit and veg and um, I think that needs to be explored. Um, and uh, again the point that um, CSA being a, a different model um, and that the local veg box schemes don't necessarily mean that uh, the veg and fruit that they supply is locally grown because they do um, outsource some of that um, and just a question about the resilience um, between the two different models there um, that's not to say that we don't need to import fruit and veg I think we do um, but just a, a question and some ideas to explore around resilience um, and and supply chains um, and then with that um, I noticed that supermarkets are supplying um, their own veg boxes um, and I saw on the website for Morrison's that they um, explicitly said that they're supplying cheaper um, veg boxes than, for example, Riverford and Avon and Cole, and um, made it explicit the, the, dif the difference in price. Um, so that would look to be undercutting um, these small scale uh, veg box uh, schemes, um, small scale compared to supermarkets. Um, and there's obviously some um, issues around that for the, for the producers who are already um, undercut um, and suffering competition from them. It also opens up a wider societal and political question of enabling people to pay more for food um, when a lot of uh, people's income goes towards things like housing, very high rents, um, potentially uh, mortgages, things like that, and um, where that money is going and, and really where it should be going um, and the fact that we could potentially be paying more for food if um, income wasn't spent um, disproportionately on those uh, on things like housing. Um, so I think I'll finish there. Um, thanks very much for listening and um, it would be good to get some questions at the end. Brilliant. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you very much. Um, I was just going to say we've had questions on the chat that Theo's collecting. We've also had answers on the chat, which is very exciting as well. Um, so Theo, after Nick's presentation, will come back with some questions. So if you've got questions for Jazz, get them um, onto uh, the chat now. Yes, Theo is quite right. There will be a recording. We'll pop it on uh, YouTube for you in uh, short order, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Nick now. Uh, who's going to do his presentation. Okay, so, here we go. Cheers, Nick. I've, I've unmuted myself. I'm going to try and share my screen. Oh, where are we? There we go. Yep. Uh, there we go. Is that all visible to everyone? Good, good. Okay, so there are three things. So you've got the, um, the main slide that I've got, and um, I'll go through some slides, but I've got three things to, to mention before or before getting started. First of all, this is arguably um, the third time that I've um, had a go at uh, joining you guys at CCRI. <clears throat> First of all, last April, we were booked to come and do a talk, but unfortunately my colleague had her visa declined, so we had to cancel that. Then I was going to speak in uh, March, but then um, the, 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 the situation of the pandemic took over, so I couldn't talk then. Um, but so most of the information I've got for today comes from my co-director Genevieve and she's actually also, it's worth noting, she's under lockdown in Kampala so she's getting information via the phone from, from as they call it, upcountry on the farm. The second thing I want to mention before getting going but it's still relevant is that many thanks to CCRI for all your information during this lockdown. These blogs, tweets, these events have been excellent. It's really refreshing to, um, to reconnect with the practicalities and what people are doing and so on. Um, and then thirdly, my third sort of critical point is that I think agroecology is, is a matter of urgency, um, whether that's as a practice, as a science, or indeed as a social movement. It's urgent whether that's in relation to COVID-19 or in respect of, of dealing with climate change, biodiversity decline, fulfilling the sustainable development goals. 
We know out there in the rural landscape, agroecology is pitted against agribusiness, which is much more powerful with support from the state and private sector. So um, in response to last week's session, just a, I, I dipped in or, or listened to a recording, I can't remember. I don't think we should place agroecology on some high pedestal. In my view, um, outside the academic world, agroecology links to all forms of progressive environmental citizenship. It's not exclusive, but sustainable farming for all. That's a sort of a general critical comment. Um, many thanks for inviting me. I'm Nick James, I'm associate lecturer with the Open University. And I think in the past I've worked with Matt on, on some modules within the OU. Um, I've also done another seminar a couple of years back with Liz Child. We spoke about local agricultural policies, um, raising support for food production via horticultural um, belt within Gloucestershire. Um, so that was um, a couple of years ago on, in the January, I think it was. So um, I'll just say that this talk about Uganda and agroecology strikes a particular interest. If it does for, a, for anyone, I would be more than happy to share my contact details as a website, blogs, ETFE, also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and that's mostly thanks to young and talented people out there in Uganda. Um, the website, um, would be easy to find, but I've, I'll, I'll, I'll share it um, in due course. My research and work with agroecology is independent of the Open University. It's worth um, noting that, although occasionally there are opportunities to highlight the work with new modules that are being written. Um, there's a brand new module, DD319, which pays good attention to some great work on food self-provisioning you may have heard about with Petr Jelicka and with um, another chapter on agroecology as a social movement with Les Levydow, who recently did a talk at um, the Centre for Agroecology, Water Resilience, Coventry University. Um, interesting talk there. I want to emphasise that beyond and um, after the pandemic, ETFE's Uganda Enterprise um, warmly welcomes visitors, researchers, work placements, uh, gap year students, any talented farmer types who want to visit, stay and work on the land. Um, we've made good connections with other universities, including University of East Anglia, UE down in Bristol, Coventry and so on. It is an amazing opportunity. I know it's, it's sort of prohibitive and sort of problematic with travelling right now and uh, there's a sort of slight anti-air air travel um, feature in society, but um, nevertheless, um, it, if if it were possible, you'd be you'd be most welcome. I did I did the same back in the late eighties, and I did my PhD in Zimbabwe, focusing on cotton farming um, back then. So first of all, my aim is to explain the origins of um, ETFE. Um, just see if the second slide comes up. Uh, no, it's, um, secondly, two years since the start of ETFE's agroecology farming, it's important to update on things, how things are going this year in particular with COVID-19 and see how people are coping. And thirdly, I want to explain the farming enterprise social impact ambitions and prospects for integrating research opportunities. The Live for Soil, Soil to Live program, which welcomes visitors and researchers. And then I also want to highlight the researcher network that we specialize in. We also maintain connections with NGO network, alternative farming sector, and in particular, an organization called Kulika Uganda, who instilled back in the 80s early dedication to integrated and sustainable farming. In respect to research, we're poised and prepared to work with um, agrobiodiversity food 
and Resilience Network for Africa, ARENA, which is um, Cross Fingers about to be funded and will be involved with that. And if I, I'm just trying to see if I can move my slides. Um, hold on. Uh, are you able to see that one? Yeah. Um, uh, so if, if I, I'm just trying to move. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's um, an example of a kitchen garden being produced and uh, so that's more detail of the of the, the potential research that we're connected with um, the global challenges research fund um, it's looking at indigenous cuisine in in africa but we're, we're also connected to the kenyan and south african um, uh, facets of that So back in 2009, 2000, um, so yeah, that, there's the Kalika and, and there's the sort of background too. Back in 2018, we launched Ibonyu Transformation Farm Enterprise, ETFE for short. We set up a piggery, an acre of passion fruit, organic citrus orchard, beekeeping in some large mango trees, local sorotti chickens, livestock, including cows for milk, uh, also ploughing and sort of fitting in with the existing agro diversity and cropping strategies that exist locally. But other important features that we initiated included um, much more focus on seed saving, water harvesting. We set up a farmers group called Lobo Farmers Group, um, indigenous crop rotation, crop, crop experimentation, uh, creating kitchen gardens. And ETFE is therefore strongly focused on the principles of organic sustainable farming, specifically in areas of interest include reviving and encouraging local minor crops, um, indigenous foods, seed saving methods, researching lo locally, awareness raising, traditional organic pra practice. In 2019, we began the process of um, growing a particular crop locally called Isuk, but um, commonly known as Bambara roundnut or Vigna subterranean. It's um, an almost forgotten crop, but um, historically extremely irrelevant for nutrition um, in, in, in times gone past across Africa and other parts of the world. The farming achieves what we call mixed or circular farming. Examples include applying most of the manure from the piggery in either the kitchen gardens or among the passion fruit plants. In 2019, um, we grew two, two varieties of chickpeas. Um, the aim was to seed, seed save for several seasons in order to have successful varieties for the local conditions and to distribute and a recropping among the farmers group that we set up uh, just late last year. And Lobo, the name for the farmers group, which they all agreed on, is of the local command language which means soil so there's a passion for soil passion for the environment within the group various local members are searching for a local cassava variety which lives for five years in the garden and can uh, has a smaller yield than the newer nigeria variety and yet um, the the quality is that it has better storage value stronger resilience to, res to disease the importance of of these crops is therefore for me entangling questions of both food security and food sovereignty. In December 2019 we held meetings with the local district, Kalaki districts, to let them know of our approaches and perspectives and they're very supportive and would like to join us in them, particularly with the honey production and distribution. We've also succeeded uh, growing a crop of popcorn for which we have um, a big demand from, from Kampala and the, the person, the customer is willing to buy almost any quantity, so that's a good sign. With all foods, there's uh, mixed objectives of local food provisioning, 
shopping, barter, exchange, sale in the local markets, but also farther afield in Kampala and, and customers in Kenya as well. So just briefly with the pandemic, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite difficult to just summarize uh, exactly what's going on because it's a, a lockdown and um, the biggest thing is that there's the, the all markets, all weekly markets have been cancelled and therefore a significant part of where people can get food has disappeared. The sad economic consequence of that is that there's been a, a, a significant decline in price of um, perishable foods and vegetables and so on and without the market it's difficult to sell prices have gone down for livestock as well so that's probably the, the most significant message I got in, a, in an email yesterday from from colleagues is that um, people are farming the the, the, the the rains are good and so on but it's it's a it's a very difficult situation when it comes to to, to marketing so um, just uh, moving towards the end um, June 19th 2019 we we set up this uh, live for soil soil to live um setting um uh, that uh, the point that um sev several flower plants were planted in the the compound homestead and they're all doing well um flowers will be to decorate and surround the centerpiece around this kitchen garden and demonstration plot with a varieties of indigenous and local crops edible vegetables it has been applied as a space for experiment with water harvesting and I don't know if any of you've heard of the Piri, uh, Zephaniah Piri from Zimbabwe, we've, we've, we've dug a Piri pit to enable soil to seep through the, uh, to enable water to seep um, more, more, more thoroughly through the soil. We've also got a poor man's water tank in the middle again to, to help when, once rains come to, to, to distribute the water within the soil. Um, within the compounds we're lucky to have a, a neem tree, a very young tamarind tree, sweet bananas, very large mango tree, chili, chili shrubs, avocado, citrus yet to be identified and much much more. The plot is actively in our use but the legacy of a previous owner and an indication of that rich interest in growing food in the kind of homestead area. Someone's offered us some ginger plants as well. We've got jackfruit trees surrounding the homestead is about two and a half acres. In a year we've had uh, crops of maize, popcorn, chickpeas, beans, um, cassava and recently uh, we've moved all the chickens from the other site for practical family reasons. There are four solidly built thatched homes with windows, lockable doors, partition space, and a small veranda. Most of the finance to set this up came from a, a crowdfunder last year. Um, and we've also got two door toilet, bathroom space, and kitchen space. Just to re reiterate, um, you know, marketing for anyone that might be interested in doing some research or visiting, um, the accommodation is, you know, it, it's good, it's a great experience. If anyone is interested, you know, they're very welcome and, you know, there's, there's there people there to help and, and, and get you set within and so on. There's also a 10 minute video on the website, which you can watch to get more information, and get more of a, a visual sense of what it's like. <clears throat> so just to, you know, getting towards the end. And, um, my research interest is based on critical um, issues around the changing and revived indigenous or traditional knowledge when it comes to um, integrated um, agroecology practices. Agroecology itself promotes conservation and the revival of indigenous knowledge. This emphasis on of sovereignty uh, of lo the local community, its culture and place. The idea behind ETFE is therefore to enable farming livelihoods that build upon knowledge and skills and the 
food producers need to develop and manage localized food production. So there's a there's a kind of a, an awareness of um, what people know and what people are beginning to forget, and perhaps a revival of of some past knowledge. However, in much um, academic work, we know that agrarian studies, political ecology, have distanced themselves from these sort of local contexts, these specificities and particularities. And without without much question, it's argued strongly that through observation that conventional modernization, the, the, the kind of thrust that's been going on the last hundred years, uh, agribusiness approaches in farming definitely undermine ag um, local approaches, um, whatever they are really, and um, further marginalize those livelihoods um, and any resistance and um, agency that those households at local levels. Therefore, this, this um, wider, bigger thrust impedes the prospects for agroecological success. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Um, I don't know if your slides have got stuck there. Um, we can still see um, the outline. Um, oh, yes. By moving them on. There we go. <laughs> Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry, yeah, there were there were some more slides. Yeah, I don't. I, I'll flick right. through them. Sorry, because they're, they're quite nice. So, this, so, so that previous one showed that the, the practice of kitchen garden being built. This is um, uh, our efforts at science and and research. We, we're collecting a massive list of you know lo local foods, local crops, local insects, whatever, and 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 I've tried to get all the scientific names uh, for for them. That's a very long list. Um, the movement local and uh, water, water collection spot there, a, a, a rainy day, a bicycle, <laughs> um, agroecology's entanglement of science practice and social movement. Uh, and I've got these sort of, um, these are the, the, the beehives that we, we built, uh, they were put up into a tree. Um, there's a fam the family homestead there, I think that's just um, renewing with with cassava. Yeah, so these are other comments about agroecology, his connection, respecting nature, the sacred, the old, indigenous understanding and working through nature, seeing, not seeing it as separate, but with us. Um, That's brilliant. Thank you. Nick. Yeah, I think yeah. we just, some well, of us weren't sure whether the slides were moving or not. Yeah. Um, so it's really great to be able to see them because those of us who knew what was in your presentation, we're looking forward to sharing these slides from the project with everybody. So that's that's really yeah, great that we've got to see them. Um, that's brilliant. So thank you very much, Nick. That was really inspiring and really helpful. Now I'm hoping there are questions for everybody. So I'm going to hand over to Theo, who hopefully has got some questions to pose. So um, Nick and Jazz, leave your microphones on. Hi, everyone. Yeah, questions for everyone. Um, the first question will be for Jazz. Um, the first question that we had, so a lot, some questions in the, there were some questions in the chat about um, what were, what was the trend in veg boxes and CSA before the COVID crisis? And what was the marketing strategy before? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of the marketing strategy, um, there's probably quite a lot of use of things like Instagram, um, which is very visual um, and that, that helps to um, put across the message of the kind of um, production and, and food that people are getting. But I think there are a lot of constraints there around um, time for people to, to put into doing that and also knowledge around those kind of different technologies and um, how best to use them. and, and um, information and um, advice around marketing strategies in general and also things like business planning um, is something that I think um, a lot of small scale producers are in need of and, and want. Um, I did a bit of work with the Soil Association for the Future Growers um, and that was something that um, that, um, that particular group of people were very interested in. Um, and there are some good um, examples out there and there are people who, who do have um, really good strategies. But I think a lot of the um, smaller scale producers are looking to supply locally. Um, that's not to say they don't need marketing, but I think um, 
um, their focus is very much uh, on that local um, uh, spread of uh, customers. So um, they try and, and reach out um, maybe in, in more sort of person to person kind of um, marketing strategies than, um, than wider technology. Um, and the same for the CSAs. With the CSAs, um, as I said before, it's a very much um, a commitment between producers and um, the food citizens who um, enter into that partnership. So um, it's not so much there about the marketing um, with those kind of almost being sort of pre-arranged um, models, um, but definitely it's something that um, as a CSA network, we want to um, encourage more CSAs to be set up uh, and looking into ways to do that and provide training. Just um, to continue on that, I, I, I asked a question as I was in terms of marketing strategies, this is from my own experience because I only found out about these boxes when I needed them because of the crisis. I, I didn't even know they existed. So I was just wondering, like before there was this massive crisis, how did people know about these things? How, how did they reach out? Not necessarily marketing strategies, but how, how did they get people to know about them? How, yeah, I think that's something that we still need to look into. Yeah. Uh, so a question, um, as far as I'm aware, Natasha might have um, another um, point on that. So feel free to speak up, uh, Natasha, if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that we do need to look into. How, um, why weren't they using Regbox teams before? Um, yeah. and how have they, how have they found out about them? Yeah, Natasha saying. Um, recommendation and word of mouth is always the best way um, and it's true yeah and i know it's rob trying to make us jealous with bragging that he's got strawberries in his box this week <laughs> yeah nick and jazz i have a question a bit for you both uh, something that people wonder is how producers um in uganda and in uk were able to deal with differential demand because we all know that veg don't grow in one day so um or be or getting honey is not you know you don't get it in one day so how to cope with the fact that the demand fluctuates a lot during this time and that you commit when you're a grower um, to grow a certain amount of crop that might not be useful did you have did you have any feedback on this kind of issue well, I think um, the timing was quite, in a way, um, quite lucky with COVID because it was the start of the growing season. So um, producers were able to expand by putting more in the ground uh, early on. But whether that, you know, um, whether the the customers will stay on during this harvest period, you know, it's a big, big risk for them um, financially and, and in other t uh, terms of other resources as well. Um, so I think really the timing with that was lucky, whether um, if it had started now, whether they'd be able to expand production, I'm not so sure. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Nick. Well, Uganda has two rainy seasons, so there's, there's a chance to have two, two croppings uh, during the year. Um, the, the interesting thing is when we set up in 2018, it was a disastrous, unprecedented use of a drought that had never been seen before. So it was a horrific start to, for us. And it wasn't the drought per se, it was actually the, the impact on livestock. All the pigs um, uh, died because of the, the, they, they became stressed and then got exposed to uh, swine flu and perished and so there was a kind of wipeout of of livestock across the region it wasn't just um, within the farm and lo and behold a couple of weeks later all the chickens died and that again a different disease but based on the intensity of the, the stress but luckily this year has been a good good year but it's obviously been curtailed by the inability to to sell the produce you know so when produce is made um, how, how do you redistribute it? So I hope that answers your question. And, and in Uganda, do, do they have any way to, because we are talking about perishable products, um, do they have any way to keep them for a longer time, to transform them into something that can be kept for a longer time to, to wait for the market to reopen? 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I gave that example of cassava. The, the people are sort of saying, actually, the cassava that we used to grow is much better. It may be smaller in yield, but it can store better. So when, once you dry it, it can, because cassava is, is perishable and it, and, it, and it doesn't last very long. I know I brought some back from there and within days, even in the fridge, it's, it's inedible. So, so um, the, the, the older type of cassava, um, is resistant to disease, but is also um, much easier to store once it's dried. So drying is 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 the, the key example for for some of the foods. Yeah. Yeah, and just add to that, I think we you know we did have a culture of um, things like chutney and preserves, um, and they've got a very strong culture of that in Japan, um, producing many kinds of uh, pickled vegetables um, that are really uh, flavoursome and nutritional as well. Um, and that helps them to, um, I mean, traditionally it helped them to um, be able to eat good food all year round. And so I think that's something that we need to kind of revitalize and see more of. Yeah, thanks for this very helpful content. Um, Jazz, I have a question maybe for you. Um, uh, someone was wondering, um, what about the supermarket, whether they're trying to exploit uh, the Romans about veg boxes? And how do you feel about um, the wider non-local veg boxes and how to get on with them? Yeah, so I mentioned um, Morrison's um, have, they have um, released a, a British only um, veg box and an organic veg box. Um, and they do say, um, unfortunately, they, they make it explicit the price difference between them and um, other veg box producers. Um, so I think that is an issue in, in undercutting them. And um, someone also asked a question, Helena also asked a question about um, policies. And I think um, with the uh, agriculture bill and the clause two um, rejection to date, um, of um, having equal trade standards uh, and food produced to equal standards coming into the UK. I mean, that alongside um, supermarkets marketing veg boxes at, at cheaper prices is not going to help the situation at all. And um, so I think we, we need a strong political will here to deal with um, producing uh, more veg in our own country, especially, you know, we import almost 50% of our, our veg. It's a huge figure and we know that we can grow more and we know that there's a demand for more. So it basically comes down to political will um, to change that and to put those policies in place to ensure that our um, farmers are supported and that farmers under five hectares do also receive some support. Lovely. Thank you, Jazz. I'm going to jump in now because we're very close to running out of time and I don't want us to sort of go past the time that we agreed with everybody, partly because it's lunchtime, so people to start devouring themselves with all this talk of food. Um, and also that, you know, it's kind of important we keep to time. But what I'd say is if you want to slide over to Slido, slido.com S386, you'll see a little poll about what we should cover in future webinars. Um, so just to say that next week, we are joined from Ludovine, uh, by Ludovine from Cardiff University to talk about citizenship and Brexit and food policy from a more legal perspective, which is quite exciting. And then Steve's going to join us live from Japan to talk about what's going on in Japan, which is really exciting. Jazz is going to be in the chair, so she's going to have my job and I'm going to uh, be in the audience, um, which is going to be fun. And Jazz is going to be knock it out of the park, I'm absolutely certain. Uh, just to remind everybody that we put this up on YouTube and as soon as I can get that processed this afternoon, it will be up on YouTube for your future use. Nick very kindly um, sort of did a little advert for all of our Twitter feeds and all that's on the website because I know that a lot of the team are putting a huge effort into that. So um, thank you very much. I'm hoping that people can see on Slido uh, this little poll, so have a go at that. And thank you very much for the uh, chat. And what we can do usually in um, Zoom is catch the chat independently. Um, so we will make sure that we take note of all of that because I'm conscious that as well as answers today, we were giving people, um, you know, we were asking questions and giving people uh, solutions at the same time. So 
that's uh, really quite uh, a unique feature because we have such uh, an informed audience. So if you want to go over to Slido and uh, just I'll give this a couple of minutes of more of this poll and then we'll move to the, the final poll. I'm conscious that there's also a degree here to the CCRI people voting for what they'd like to see next, you know, so um, that's always good fun. So yeah, more of our own work is always quite a nice thing to take part in. Okay, so just a few moments now and then I'm going to slide over to the final poll and bid you all good afternoon. Okay. All right, we haven't gone up for a moment or two, so I'm guessing everybody who wanted to take part has taken part in that poll. So just the final question that we have to pose, how would you rate today's webinar um, so we can learn? Because I think we've emphasized all the way through this that this is a learning experience for all of us. It's experimental times. So um, yeah, please do give um, some feedback. And also we're very happy to uh, take feedback offline because I think you know we, we all need to um, we all need to sort of think about how we're doing these things in the future. Um, brilliant. So I'll just leave that up for a moment or two. Just watching the numbers go up and um, please book in um, on the next thing for on Eventbrite. So yeah, I'm just watching how many people. So if you want to slide over to Slido, you've got like 60 seconds left to um, do that. Thank you, Grace. Thanks for taking your lunch time and uh, carving out some time in the day. Really appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna gonna just wrap up that poll. We're just gonna leave that. So, just to repeat, thank you very much for everybody for your participation today. Really exciting. Really pleased to see people taking the time and joining us and taking part in this and really, really appreciate your participation. Uh, please join us again at some point in the future when you're able to, um, as we keep these events rolling. And um, thank you very much. So I'm gonna press the end button. Could, um, maybe we could just post um, our YouTube site where um, we'll post all the recordings. Yeah, do you have that to hand, Jazz? I'm getting it now. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Good suggestion. But my fingers are now losing pace. <laughs> okay, here we go. So there we go. There's our YouTube channel there. However did we come up with that title for the YouTube channel? <laughs> failure, failure of our imagination. <laughs> Brilliant. So there. thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much, Jazz. Really thank appreciate it. Thank you all for, for taking part today. Um, yeah, and thanks so much to Natasha's um, contribution yeah, as well. That's great. And Helena and Rose for turning up. So many people. That's brilliant. Okay. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye.